Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Musgrave. I'm with the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. It's May 22nd. We're in Washington, D.C. with Ambassador Richard Fairbanks. Ambassador Fairbanks, thank you for joining us. Well, I've been looking forward to it because uh, discussing those old days always brings back happy memories. Well, as we were uh, uh, talking about off camera before, um, you come from a family with some deep political roots. Uh, yes, if you, if you think Hoosiers have deep roots, that's true. I grew up in Evansville, so I, uh, I happen to are. think that. There we are. Um, tell us about your dancing partner um, when, you were, uh, when you were back in Indianapolis. Well, uh, when I was growing up in Indianapolis, my next door neighbor uh, was, uh, I forget, I'm trying to think of his first name, he was Bill Rucklesshouse's uncle, Bruz, B-R-U-Z, I forgot what that was a nickname for. And uh, Bruz's niece, who was Bill Rucklesshouse's sister, I went to dancing school with, and in the eighth grade when we were in dancing school, I was the shortest of all the boys and all the girls. I was five feet tall, and she got her growth early, and she was over 6'3", when we had dancing classes, and so I learned how to dance in an unusual posture with Bill Rucklesshouse's sister. Did you leave? Absolutely not. She was bigger and tougher than I was. You went to school um, a little bit in Indiana, and then I believe mostly in Connecticut. Um, and True. Then you went to Yale. After you went to Yale? Well, Yale's in Connecticut, too. Well, it is in Yale, although I don't think they'd like to, to brag about it. They certainly don't <laughs> admit they're in New Haven. <laughs> You joined the Navy. Well, I didn't just join the Navy. I attended Yale on a Navy scholarship for four years. And so uh, it was obvious I was going to go in the Navy since they paid for my education. It was a wonderful scholarship. They paid full tuition, uh, room and board, free books, and what was uh, not insubstantial in those days, $50 a month spending money and a guaranteed summer job. And all you had to do was spend four years in the Navy, which was only nine months more than if you'd gone to Yale and gone to Officer Canada School and so you're trading, in effect, nine months for uh, this wonderful affair. And uh, you got a regular Navy commission, USN, as opposed to USNR. So it was a very nice program. And uh, so there's therefore no surprise that I went into the Navy. And you were in the, uh, the Seventh Fleet? No. No. Uh, actually, uh, it was during Vietnam. And uh, I volunteered to uh, uh, go out on the Pacific side and uh, go to Vietnam in particular. Uh, but. Uh, they were looking for ensigns, and I was so senior, I was lieutenant junior grade, which is, of course, the second lowest uh, officer grade. And so uh, uh, I was not an ensign, and I stayed in the Atlantic Fleet, therefore, the whole four years I was in the Navy. And you were, uh, well, you had some interesting uh, times when you were in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, passage through the Suez and, and so forth, and you would later get to uh, know that region of the world fairly well. In one cruise in the Navy, it was unusual. We. Uh, we crossed both the Arctic Circle and the equator in one cruise. And they have these special uh, uh, societies that they bring you into in the Navy when you cross. And so we became both a blue nose and a, a razorback or a hedgehog or something Half when you back. cross the Atlantic. Uh, I forgot what it was called. And we got both of those in one cruise. But uh, we did go through the Red Sea, went through down through the uh, Suez Canal, uh, went to Yemen and uh, uh, as it then was, Haile Selassie's Ethiopia, uh, and uh, Aden, and uh, down all the way around the, uh, the Horn of Africa to Kenya. So it was fascinating, and it did, did presage uh, what I ended up doing a few years later um, in a different role in the federal government. Why did you uh, go to law school? When I was a kid growing up in Indiana, uh, you mentioned uh, a forebearer of mine, my great-grandfather, uh, was a senator and a vice president and things like that. And I used to think, gosh, I happen to have been born in this interesting country, which is in a uniquely powerful position in the world, and after World War II, pretty exciting time. And I know that there are 12 people who really run the country, and uh, I want to go to Washington and find out about them. And so uh, I kind of positioned myself uh, to have the train run over me, and I figured the best way to do that to go into the federal government was to uh, become a Washington lawyer and move in and out of the government. So I became a Washington lawyer and lo and behold started moving in and out of the government and it worked. Your first job in government, um, I believe this is your first job, was working for Bill Ruckel's house at the EPA. Yes, I actually tried to get a job earlier. When I first came uh, to Washington out of law school, 
uh, worked here my second year summer uh, and then permanently after my graduation from law school. And right after graduating, Bill Ruckelhaus, my old friend from Indianapolis, was assistant attorney general. And although I had a wonderful job with a terrific law firm here, I called up Ruckelhaus and I said, hey, could I get a job in the White House? That sounds pretty exciting. And uh, he was very kind and he actually got me an interview with the White House staff with Nixon. And I interviewed a couple of these guys and they kind of patted me on the head and said, you're a nice fellow, uh, but uh, we don't have any openings. And it turned out, of course, that every single person who worked in the White House staff at that stage had been involved in the 1968 campaign. In the 1968 campaign, I was in law school, so I did not have the right tickets. And uh, Bill Ruckelhaus was kind enough to give me an interview, but no. And then when he became head of EPA, uh, he called up and he said, the president has asked me to set up this new bureaucracy. Why don't you come help me do it? And I said, what is that? And he says, Environmental Protection Agency. I said, what's the environment? He says, I don't know. We'll make it up together. So uh, we lost that. And, and, and at that stage, literally, I mean, the knowledge about environment was, was very tiny, and the number of lawsuits falling on our head was very large. So it was an exciting time. Well, we've interviewed Mr. Ruckel's house, and um, I wanted to ask some questions that uh, may not have come up then. Um, what did you do day by day? I mean, you have 12 people, as you said, 12 people in an office in K Street, and 14,000 people in this agency that's been cobbled together from, what, a half dozen federal well, departments? The major pieces of, of uh, what went to EPA uh, were from the Interior Department and the Agriculture Department. They had a couple of different pieces in those departments, but that was basically what it was put together from. And uh, uh, we literally uh, didn't even have a phone directory which plugged us in particularly well with these guys. And so what Bill Ruckelhaus did when he came and established the agency, we had a very small cadre of people and uh, had a couple of assistants to him and a couple of other uh, political appointees like the deputy and assistants and things like that. Uh, and it was a very small group. But uh, he then kind of pointed out to people, uh, you do this, you do this, you do this, so we can hit the ground running. And so. Uh, I was assigned by Bill um, the air pollution problem, Clean Air Act, uh, pesticides, uh, noise, <laughs> and something else. Um, so yes. I, I uh, ran into those areas. And so I just didn't have anything important. I just had the uh, lawsuit about should we ban DDT. That was maybe the highest profile thing we were doing. And the uh, Congress had just passed the Clean Air Act and therefore we had to set the ambient air quality standards for the Clean Air Act. And we had you know, very limited uh, time, period, like 30 days or something at the time they passed the legislation. So all of these things are just landing on us. And so all day, every day, we're just paddling along like little dogs trying to keep our head above water. What were some of your specific assignments? How did you, for instance, develop the air quality uh, standards? I mean, would you pick up your non-existent phone book and call down into the uh, agency? Or? Not really. Uh, uh, I decided our time was so short uh, and I didn't think that there were great expertise in any of the agencies we had inherited on this, certainly interior and agriculture didn't have any particular uh, expertise in this area. So uh, we turned basically to, to academe and uh, uh, unfortunately we couldn't Google at that stage <laughs> but we started doing uh, as much research as I could figure out how to do in a short period of time and looked at studies that had been done on the major pollutants. And uh, what the Clean Air Act said was uh, that the federal government needs to set ambient air quality standards to protect the public health with a reasonable margin of safety. And so for each of these pollutants, you know, H, uh, hydrocarbons, oxides of nitrogen, whatever it was, I could find something. There was one, uh, you know, something we'd hang our hat on and say there's a number and throw the number on the board. The one I couldn't find, I think, was hydrocarbons, as I recall. It's either that or NOx, uh, oxides of nitrogen. And for that particular one, of this pollutant, I couldn't find anything. Finally, I found one study done by an obscure uh, assistant professor at a small um, junior college in, in California. And he found that in areas of, of high concentration of this pollutant, that his cross-country team um, had a 5% decay in the speed of their running or something, you know, just absolutely very thin evidence, I will say that. So we said, okay, there's a number for that one. So we sent all these numbers up on the board. Now, um, those were the numbers set up as the original numbers under the Clean Air Act. Since then, a number of industries, uh, trade groups, others have said, boy, we ought to take a look at those numbers and change them. 
and the environmental groups come and they say, we can't change those numbers. They were handed down by Moses. Unfortunately, I happen to be Moses, <laughs> which is fairly bizarre. My, my children and grandchildren say, you really are old, aren't you? <laughs> Well, I, I think that this will give hope to uh, any scholars who are watching this uh, that you know, their publications will be used in some. <laughs> kind of scary, sense. but true. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> well, this is this is an interesting thing. I mean, I'm I'm interested in this. I want to spend a little bit of time because you were there for six or seven months, but it was a critical six or seven months. It was an exciting six or seven. Months. I mean, th this is a brand new agency, and, and you know, Mr. Ruckel's house had some experience on this from working on air pollution and other environmental problems in Indiana. Uh, he'd oh, actually, did he? He'd been uh, deputy attorney general. Uh, no, he'd been assistant attorney general. Uh, deputy AG of the state of Indiana. Oh, the state of Indiana. Yeah. And also speaker and, of the House right. in Indiana. Right. Um, yeah, over there in the General Assembly. So right. he'd, uh, although I think working with Democratic governors, I'm not sure how much he got done at that point. Um, so, you know, there was a little bit of, but the what's interesting to me now, almost 40 years later, looking at this, is the disparity between the importance and the public image and the legacy that this has become for the Nixon administration and how quickly and you know I won't say haphazardly but you know just how thin as you say the evidence was was there a sense when you were putting this together that this you know that when you were putting these numbers on the board that they'd be lasting forever no no I mean it never occurred to me that that they would they would be uh you know, written written down on, on a template like like Moses had handed down, or or uh, etched etched like the uh, trophy for the British Open in golf or something. Absolutely not. We we were doing the best we could under the time time deadlines we had, and it never occurred to me that they wouldn't be uh, uh, moved according to new studies and new facts and and uh, and, and uh, of course new pollutants. Uh, I think I'm not even sure they've added any pollutants since we did it. It's amazing. Of course, the other big one, as I mentioned, was DDT, and DDT once again. Uh, turned to Agadine, and uh, uh, I put together an advisory board on DDT, and uh, the most fam famous man in the field was Dr. Emil Mrak, M-R-A-K, Mrak, at the University of California, Davis. I don't know why I still remember all this stuff, but I do. And uh, so we had an advisory group under his chairmanship of, of people who were expert in the fields of, uh, of pollution uh, caused by uh, various kinds of uh, insecticides, pesticides, etc. And of course, it's a very, very highly volatile uh, issue, and it still is for that matter. Um, and so, you know, some say this, some say that, some say it's not hurting at all, you can drink it for breakfast every morning, some say it's getting stored in your little fatty cells, it never goes away, and in a generation or two will all be wiped out. I mean, it's just one of those nasty issues. And so we listen and we listen and we listen, and uh, they come in with a report, and like every scientific advisory committee I was ever involved with, their, their final report said, what we need is a few million more, do uh, more dollars and a couple more years of study. And I said, sorry, we got, a, we got a, uh, a lawsuit here that says you must, you know, make a report on this and make a decision uh, within X number of days, which was not many. So I remember uh, Ruckel House was very busy at those, uh, that stage, and I literally couldn't find uh, a time on his calendar to go talk to him about what was arguably the highest profile decision he made perhaps ever at E-Pacer and the start of it. So I managed to get on this plane, he was going back to Indiana to give a speech, and uh, I wheeled my way onto the plane, so I'm briefing him on the plane and going out and he gets ready, he gives a speech, and we're talking about it on the way back, and he says, that's a pretty tough decision. Uh, he says, what should we do? I said, some say yes, some say no. He says, if you were doing it, what would you do? I said, okay, what I would do is uh, cancel it for U.S. uses but keep uh, the ability to manufacture it and sell it abroad because, you know, the people with, uh, with all these mosquitoes in, in uh, Africa and things like that, they have a different balance as between um, the threat to humans and, and, uh, and the imp uh, impact on their health. So we did that, and then I wrote the decision. And, of course, I was recently out of law school, and I thought I was an, uh, a legal scholar. And I remember writing with regard to the foreigners, we do not uh, presume to regulate the felt necessities of other lands, uh, which made me think uh, maybe I was going to be Supreme Court clerk someday, or, or justice. So he, he came up with this decision. And ever since then, regularly, every few months, or now, now down to once a year, uh, the Wall Street Journal writes a big editorial attacking Ruckelhaus uh, for making this DDT decision. And as time went on, 
of course, I then worked in the White House. I worked in the Reagan administration. Um, I was involved with various conservative Republican organizations. And so Ruckelhaus, um, when he is feeling humorous and to uh, pull my chain, as we say, uh, he says to me, now how come I, Ruckelhaus, get to be known as a liberal Republican, you, Fairbanks, get to be known as a conservative Republican, but you were the one who wrote the DDC decision. I said, because you signed it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is how things work in the government, of course. It wasn't known as the Fairbanks decision. No, no, I mean, it's, uh, um, th th that's actually a classic government story. Yes, it is. Uh, I so <laughs> and it's true, even. I, I want to ask you, because you, you listed something that I don't think that people today would consider to be part of the environment, uh, noise. Oh, yeah. No, noise. noise was definitely uh, one of the things. That was one of the, the major pieces that we had. We had pesticides, radiation, uh, noise, water, air, and solid wastes. Those were the six. Is there anything you didn't have? No, it was those six. Like those those six. Are, that was the okay. six, right. But it's pretty broad. Um, yeah, sure. So how, how do you regulate noise? in well, six months with... Well, well uh, again, a, a noise was not the top of my agenda. The top of my agenda, as it turned out, was air quality and, and pesticides. Uh, but noise, again, was, you know, the, the racket that uh, uh, someone that breaks up the pavement has in town and, and how, lar lou how loud can you have your, your muffler-free uh, uh, motorcycle running around town in and things like that, uh, which I think they still do have federal noise standards, uh, although some people ignore them entirely, and certainly the people who ride motorcycles around me ignore it. Uh, but that was one of the one of the areas where there is um, a federal statute and federal regulation. And your title at this point is special assistant uh, to, to the administrator. The administrator. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like you had a pretty broad portfolio. Um, were you accompanying Mr. Ruckel's house, or were you spending most of your time doing task-oriented stuff? Yeah, the latter. Uh, as I said, Bill was very busy. I had trouble even seeing him to talk about the uh, the uh, DDT decision. Uh, actually, his wife Jill and I. Uh, she and I went off and gave a couple of speeches together. I used to give speeches on my own quite a bit. I remember my first speech was to the Southern Plant Board uh, about uh, uh, DDT and Aldrin Dieldrin and 245T and how do we stop the fire ant and all this stuff down in Louisiana. And I remember I gave a speech uh, about, Ray, uh, about General EPA and what it was doing out in Las Vegas. And the first question I got in the little press conference after I gave the speech was about the number one issue then and still uh, for the guys in Nevada, and that was Yucca Mountain and what are we going to do about nuclear waste. And I casually, off the top of my head, said, oh, well, we haven't solved that problem yet, but we will someday. Maybe we'll just put it in a rocket and shoot it out to space. Headline uh, in Las Vegas paper the next morning, and Ruckel, you know, EPA official says, fire the stuff into space. And Ruckelhaus gets this in the clipping the next morning. He says, what are you doing out there? <laughs> so I got, I got a, a quick education on be careful what you say. At this point, you're 29, 30 years old? 28. 28? Yeah. Um, and Jill Ruckel's house is, I guess, on the White House staff by this point? No, no, no. Oh. No. She was his wife of. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I'm thinking back to the Ruckel's house interview we did. Um, how did you, you uh, did you participate at all? I know that they had about 2,000 uh, personnel slots to fill. Did you help at all in that? I wasn't there that long. I mean, right. as you said, you know, I was working on these crazy problems, which were fairly uh, uh, tough to handle. And also, uh, toward the latter part of my stay there, and just as I was transitioning, I guess, into the White House, um, I had brought one friend of mine in from law school um, who had been a Supreme Court law clerk. And so he came in as, as uh, some legal title at uh, EPA, not general counsel, but uh, legal advisor or something like that. And so he and I then taught the first environmental law course in the history of the United States of America, uh, which we taught in the night section at Georgetown Law School. And we would uh, give our students what they thought were hypotheticals, but they were actually the real questions we were dealing with during the day. And if they had any good ideas, we'd steal them. Uh, th this is, again, very inspirational uh, for, for law students. Um, did you know of any direction coming from the White House on these issues? I'm asking because you soon thereafter go to the White House. Yeah, I think, well, the reason I ended up going to the White House is we used to have interagency meetings. 
and uh, at the interagency meetings, uh, I or someone else on behalf of EPA, but since I was there, it was usually me, uh, would duke it out with uh, representative, for example, of the Commerce Department, and uh, we would say, from the EPA standpoint, this is a perfectly nice, rational regulation we're going to come out with, and uh, it will make a, a tinker's dam piece of difference uh, to the economy of the country. And the Commerce Department says, rabid-eyed environmentalist and EPA, this is going to bring the entire economy to a standstill. They don't know what they're doing. You know, this is crazy. And so uh, I, would, I would say at these meetings, on occasion, you know, just uh, instead of having arguments that don't really meet, that go past each other like that, what we really ought to do is have some uh, neutral arbiter uh, with some credibility come in and be the referee. And so I guess I said that often enough in enough meetings uh, that the guys on the White House side said, that's not a bad idea. So they brought me in the White House, and the first day I was there, they said, you've got to follow up on that idea of yours. And uh, so we went to see the head of the Council of Economic Advisors, Paul McCracken. And so uh, uh, I make my pitch to Paul McCracken, same kind of thing. You need an arbitrator who, who can talk about uh, trade-offs and, and cost-benefit analysis with credibility and have people stand up and salute. How about Council of Economic Advisors? And McCracken, and I said micro and macro and supply and demand and a few things like that. And uh, so McCracken leans back in his chair and he says, young man, I was then young, he says, uh, that was a very interesting presentation. And uh, where did you study economics? Well, I didn't study economics. I was a history major. I took one Econ 10 course. And so I said, well, I went to Yale and changed the subject. And ever since then, uh, almost all the people I worked with in the government thought I was an economist. <laughs> because all you have to do is say micro, macro, and supply and demand, as far as I figured out. I think it's working for Geithner, too. <laughs> uh, so did, did CEA end up taking that responsibility? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK. And actually, uh, the way we ended up setting it up was we set up something called, euphemistically, the Quality of Life Review. And the Quality of Life Review, uh, with input from EPA and the, and the uh, Domestic Council, under the rubric of leadership from uh, Council of Economic Advisors, and that was the way we reviewed potential uh, regulations. Well, this sounds a little bit like what ends up happening with OMB review of regulations more generally. Now, yeah, but this was this was Brand you know, new. making it up as we went along, right? Right. We interviewed uh, Jim Tozzi at OMB <laughs> yeah. about yeah, good old Tozzi. <laughs> the, the, well, the growth of the regulatory state, which is, you know, this is this is a huge part of it. Um, you come over to the domestic council. Who do you report to? John Whitaker. And John Whitaker, of course, was, uh, was very assistant? interested in. Yeah, he'd been yeah. assistant secretary of interior, and he'd been around. I think no, 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 no. He went to interior afterward. Oh, okay. uh, he, he was he, the reason he was working in the White House staff was he was the head advance man for Nixon when he ran for president in '68. Having been an advance man for Nixon in 1960, having been an advance man for Nixon when he ran for governor in '62, he was an old Nixon family retainer, and so uh, uh, he ended up working with John Ehrlichman, uh, and his, his title was associate director of the Domestic Council. Mm -hmm. And after the '72 election, then he went to Interior. What was the difference between being at the Domestic Council and being at EPA? Well, obviously it's very heady stuff to work in the White House uh, because uh, John and I had under our wing the Secretary of Interior, the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, the head of EPA, um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, NASA, um, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Trust Territories, and a bunch of other things. And so you had to be very careful because you could call up these cabinet officers and you would say, the president wants you to do so and so and so and so. And this cabinet officer would know that there's no way he could go call up Haldeman and say, I want to talk to the president and see if he really did that. And so he's taking it from this, you know, 28, 29 year old hotshot. Uh, and so, you know, you could be able to have a lot of power. Uh, but my theory was that the ones who got in trouble uh, in the Nixon White House or in any White House are the ones who convinced themselves that there was a nationwide talent search for their job and they won. But the ones who convinced themselves that this job was there before they got there and will be there after they leave and they have that perspective, they get by without their ego getting larger than all of outdoors. So you just try to make sure that you get up every morning and say, you're here for the moment, enjoy it, do your best, and go on. So if you can do that, you can survive. But obviously it's, it's, it's tremendously exciting 
uh, to have both that access to, you know, we saw the President of the United States virtually every day, uh, went to these meetings with all the top level people, uh, used to go up to the Hill and people listen to you, give interviews and people write it down. I mean, it's very heady stuff. Did you work with John Ehrlichman directly? Yes. What was he like? John was very smart. Uh, he was very focused. Um, he was intimidating, I think, to us younger guys. And uh, um, he was very protective and supportive of his staff. And of course, there were always, you know, internal fights as there always are in the White House between the various power brokers and things like that. And uh, National Security Council was run by, you know, a self-effacing, quiet little guy named Henry Kissinger. And uh, George Shultz was, you know, another quiet guy. He was economic policy advisor. I mean, these are big egos bouncing around in there. Pete Peterson, you know, guys like that. And Ehrlichman uh, would take care of us and protect us when the other guys would try to pop us in the nose. So he was a good guy to work for. What did you see in, on the Domestic Council corporately, your mission as being? Designing policy, refereeing the policy process. How did you see yourself as, you know, working for the president? Yeah, both of the above. Uh, we used to um, help to initiate policy, not just off the top of our head, but, you know, with groups, both outside groups and inside the government groups. Uh, and then, um, if there were clashes, um, you know, so-and-so might be losing a piece of power to him and that kind of thing, we did the referee even punch as well, um, together with OMB. And uh, we, were, we were more uh, the creators and they were more the implementers at OMB, but, but the lines were a little bit fuzzy. And you served in, obviously, several administrations, and for people who are watching this who may not have any direct Washington experience, why is drafting a policy memorandum, or why is refereeing this process so important? Why can't somebody just walk into the Oval Office with a brilliant idea? Well, um, the, the, the job of the White House staff, I believe, properly done, uh, is to uh, make sure that when the president makes a decision, that's a decision. And that by the, by the time the president makes that decision, it has been fully aired and brought to him, either in paper or in, in person, uh, that reflects the views of the various constituencies who have something important and interesting to add to that issue. And uh, uh, presidents do that in different ways. They structure their White House staffs in different ways. The chief of staff structures in different ways. But I think all of them try to get to that position so that when the president makes his decision, it isn't off the top of his head. It isn't who talked to him last. It is a, a process that people have uh, respect for and that the president um, can feel comfortable with that he is, he is uh, uh, coming forth with an idea uh, that has been fully staffed. Because when the president does put his stamp on it, uh, even, even, for example, if he says a casual thing at a press conference or if he comes up with a new phrase in a speech, um, the staff always has to be ready to respond to press inquiry. What did he mean by that? You know, and that kind of thing. And so, you know, every word, every decision of the president is, is cross-examined, and therefore uh, there's a certain finality to it, and you don't want the finality uh, not to have been staffed out ahead of time. The president may be right, may be wrong, the staff may be right, may be wrong, but you do the best you can and give him the best advice you can and then go on from there. What were the major issues that you were working on? Because you continue to work on environmental matters throughout your time in the White House. Yeah. But as you come over from EPA, do you turn around and say, well, EPA doesn't know what they're doing about, you know, regulating the air? I mean, well, they, they got a lot stupider numbers. after I left. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that decision had been made. So it wasn't, you know, that was, that was last week's decision. It's always forward-looking. Uh, the first really, really big hot dog decision that I remember, really high-profile, high-visibility, important decision, uh, was what to do about uh, uh, the catalytic converters in automobiles. And that was a very, very hot topic. And uh, EPA was supposed to take a crack at that one. Obviously, you talk about something that had huge economic uh, uh, implications for the auto companies and the economy a as a whole. So that was a big deal. So, you know, we were very, very, very involved in that one. And there were a couple of others that were, you know, of, of similar Oh, there's another one I remember, uh, the SST. That was a very hot issue. And I worked closely with the national, with the uh, uh, President's science advisor, Ed David, uh, on that one. And, you know, the stakes were, again, tremendously high. Where are we going to spend, literally, in those days when it was big money, a billion or two, <laughs> as opposed to now, 
uh, on this SST, uh, that is the uh, supersonic transport. Uh, at the end of the day, of course, we decided not to, and uh, the Brits and the French went ahead with uh, what became the Concorde, and uh, they had to field all of themselves. Uh, of course, they lost a bunch of money, it never was commercially viable in any way, but they got the, uh, the aura of being on top of the, uh, uh, of the pedestal for that. And then, of course, another thing that was really fun uh, was uh, uh, having the White House responsibility for NASA. and. Uh, uh, going down to the to the Apollo shoots and uh, uh, going down to talk to Werner von Braun and this kind of thing that was very heady stuff also and and that was again obviously very high profile in the days of, of uh, moonshots. Well, I want to ask you two questions uh, to follow up there. And the first is, you know, on behalf of seventh or tenth graders who may be watching this for a school report, um, tell us about the catalytic converter because this is an incredible story of how the environment was directly affected by a, a Nixon era decision. Well, the idea was, um, A, should we, have, should we require, as a matter of federal law and regulation, catalytic converters on automobiles uh, to try to cut down on air pollution? Uh, or is it too technologically advanced and this is going to disadvantage uh, American cars, both in terms of cost uh, and perhaps availability, as opposed to uh, foreign cars, which you'll have to have these things, and secondarily, uh, what kind of catalytic converters that are technologically feasible and effective? Uh, do we have enough cadmium or you know whatever it is that you're going to put in these things, so that we don't send the price of that to ten thousand dollars an ounce and things like that? And there are a whole bunch of moving parts to those kinds of decisions. The thing that I remember most vividly about it personally is that as we were coming down to decision time, the head of General Motors. Uh, Heads of General Motors are very famous now. They weren't as famous then. They're pretty well known. Uh, the, the chairman CEO was a guy named Ed Cole. And Ed Cole was a technical man. You know, he didn't come from marketing and he didn't come from finance. Technical guy. And he had become head of General Motors. And he came in to talk to me about this affair. And uh, he said, we can do this. We can do this. This catalytic converter is not going to, you know, people would say, it's going to overheat and cause the cars to blow up. I mean, there were all kinds of you know, stories going around about it. He says, let me tell you, it'll really work. He says, let me give you a little example. He says, I've got a silver dollar here in my pocket. People actually had silver dollars in those days. And he put his uh, handkerchief over the silver dollar. In those days, people smoked in their office, if you can believe that evil day. And uh, so he took a cigarette, and he ground it out on the silver dollar in his palm through uh, the cloth in his hand and then held up the, the cloth and there was no burn mark, no nothing, no hole, not even a burn mark, because the heat immediately leached from the cigarette uh, directly to the metal. And he says, this is exactly what's going to happen with Kelly Converter. And he was the technical guy and he said, I said, if GM says they can do it and they're happy doing it, what's the problem? I mean, I know, you know, there was like a revelation and it really got my attention. And so uh, here it is, the, uh, you know, the uh, highest paid man in Detroit coming giving this demonstration to this 20-something in the White House. But that's the way it worked. Well, the second thing I wanted to follow up on is you mentioned the, the supersonic transport, the mm -hmm. SST. Um, and if you're working with NASA at this point, I was wondering if you were also involved with the decision on the STS, the space shuttle. No. Okay. That was after me, I think. Okay. It, there's, a, there's a lot of people who, uh, who have been involved in this. I'm, this was a, an honest question. We're just trying to find somebody who will actually talk about uh, the space shuttle. Yeah, I'm not being uh, I'm not being secretive about it. That that was after I had had this job. I, the, I, I recently was involved with it, but it was in the private sector. I was on ended up on a board of a little company called Spacehab, which made the things that they take up in the rockets, uh, the things they crawl around in, and all the rest oh. of that. So, in the private sector, I was involved with it, but not in the government. I want to ask, uh, while we're talking about the domestic council, and you're, you're talking about policy issues that are incredibly important and incredibly, you know, vivid in their debates. You know, the DDT, we're all going to die versus, you know, we can you know, drink it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, the same thing with the catalytic converters. When you're making policy, any high-profile policy, and, you know, most low-profile most low profile policy decisions have these sorts of advocates on either side. How, as a policymaker, do you sort through these uh, these questions? Well, you know, as I say, <clears throat> the policy structure, well designed, uh, should uh, require guys like 
me and the domestic council uh, to take this input here from um, an environmental group, this input here from the Chamber of Commerce, this input here from the Interior Department, this input here from the Transportation Department, bing, 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 put it all down, write a memo to the President, say that so and so advocates this, so and so advocates this, here are their arguments, and then I recommend that, or you know, the Domestic Council recommends that, or, or Ehrlichman recommends that, or whatever. And then you had three blocks at the bottom, it says approve, disapprove, or see me. And you press see me, you go to a meeting with the President about it, and otherwise he decides, and maybe he writes a note on the side, and on, the, on the fringe, and things like that. And so that was kind of the process. And so the process uh, is intended to make sure these things go up. Now, uh, the, th the theory that I developed after doing, being involved in this for a few years was um, these decisions that reach the presidential level, usually the equities are pretty evenly balanced, or they don't get it for the president. If they're really, really easy, they're done by a GS-14. If they're pretty easy, they're done by a deputy assistant secretary. A little harder, maybe an assistant secretary, on up to a cabinet officer. And if they're incredibly difficult, then they get kicked up to the White House. And so rather than agonizing with these incredibly difficult, although being important, decisions, I think it's more important to actually make the decision. Don't look back. Don't second guess yourself and go on to the next one, or the whole system goes into paralysis. And I think, again, uh, uh, White Houses and administrations, uh, sometimes particularly early in the day, get kind of frozen up uh, because, you know, they, they agonize about a particular thing, you know, right, or what are we going to do about closing Gitmo, or, you know, whatever, to do it, move on to the next, and uh, you'll have plenty more exciting ones to deal with in the future. Was paralysis a problem for the Nixon administration? When no, of course, I didn't come in at the start of it. Uh, because I say I'd been in law school when the administration started. So I, I came in, I was the first outsider, as I said, uh, wasn't on the campaign, who, who came into the White House staff. So I was kind of the first of the second generation. By then they'd had their shakedown crews. You uh, get a, a broader portfolio uh, after you've been with the Domestic Council uh, a little bit. You go from environment to energy, environment, and natural resources. Mm. It really wasn't a, a, as dramatic a change as it sounds like because, as I said, when I arrived there, I worked for John Whitaker, and John Whitaker's title was um, Associate Director for Agriculture and Natural Resources or something like that. And, uh, uh, and then after the 72 election, <laughs> another, another typical Washingtonian thing happens. Uh, of course, President Nixon won what, 49 states or something in the 72 election, and so we get a note from Ehrlichman saying, uh, put down what, what your druthers are. Sorry, that was only me. Uh, and uh, put down what your druthers are, and uh, we will try to get you uh, your heart's desire after the election. So I wrote down, I would like to be the Undersecretary of the Navy. And I've been a Navy guy. I said, oh, God, I've got to go to the Navy Department. This is fun stuff. And uh, I've had enough of the White House. I want to get out in the real world. Plus, I like. Uh, national security issues a lot better than I like domestic anyway, and then I can transition over. And so Ehrlichman takes that aboard, and the guy I'm working for, John Whitaker, says, I love the White House staff. I know it. Um, I know the president. I like working here. I'm comfortable. I don't want to go out to an agency. Let me stay here on the White House staff. So, of course, they send Whitaker out to the Interior Department, and they leave me in the White House staff. <laughs> Typical catch-22 of the government. And so um, as I took over from John, it was after the 72 election, so it was probably about the 1st of January of 1973, uh, maybe the end of December of 73. And uh, if you remember what was happening then, we were having a small problem in the Middle East, and the Arabs were rattling their sabers. And uh, so I get called in right after I take over this new title, and we didn't have energy in it. We didn't have anything to do with energy in the White House. And John Ehrlichman calls me in, and he says, this energy thing looks like it's heating up. Why don't you take a look at it and give me a recommendation? So I spend a week looking into this new problem called energy, and I come back and I say, you know, I think it really is important, but it's too important to be 10% of my time. You want me to do something about it? I've got to have a staff. And he says, oh, you empire builder. He says, okay. And so I, I go over to the State Department, I pluck out a guy who later became ambassador to Saudi Arabia, and then I go over to the Interior Department and I plug on a guy, and he later became Ken Lay. Of course, he already was Ken Lay, ironically. So they came to work for me. So that was the first energy staff, was my two little lads, the guy from the State Department and the guy from the Interior Department. So then we started uh, working. The, the way you made policy in this area was, let's have a presidential speech, and that will 
set a policy. So I start working on presidential speech. And I call some OMB guys in, and then the White House speechwriter. The White House speechwriter was Dave Gergen, who has gone on to other fame. And, uh, and so we started wrestling around on this speech. And uh, by this time, I have now, since I have moved into Whitaker's job, I can hire another guy. So I hire this guy from the office management budget, who is the best detail man I have ever seen in my life. And we used to do these White House uh, briefing sheets and white uh, papers and things like that. And his name was Glenn Schlady. And Glenn would never go home until, you know, it was 4 o'clock in the morning until all the other bureaucrats had given up and we got the position we wanted. And I, I said, I want that guy working for me. <laughs> and so he was. And he was just terrific. And so he was working on it, my two guys I'd hired from these departments and a speechwriter, and we're working on a draft energy policy speech. And it's like that cartoon on my wall says, right in the era of oil embargo buildup. So um, as we go into that period, uh, I'm sending these drafts over across West Executive over to the West Wing from the old Executive Office building where we were. And uh, the speech comes back, says it's good, just a little bit here, a little bit there. And it keeps coming back with this one uh, new phrase idea in it called Project Independence. And I said, what is that about? I mean, we can't possibly be independent of foreign oil. What kind of dippy nonsense is that? So after about the third time when this is put back in, I personally called up Hall, uh, Haldeman, which I never did. And I said, who in the world is putting in this crazy idea? He says, the old man. I said, oh, <laughs> you know, presidents get to be president. So lo and behold, we put in Project Independence. But then, of course, the president gives the speech. We have to have the briefing, as you have after presidential speeches, with the white paper, as we had. And you have to explain to the press, OK, how are we going to um, do this Project Independence? We go, nice day today, isn't it? <laughs> there was no way was the answer. And uh, you know, we're still in that kind of catch-22 after all these years. Well, I mean, at least the president didn't say that you know we're addicted to foreign oil or something. I mean, but that, that was what he was saying. He said this is really important. America's national security requires it. Therefore, as John Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon. We are going to get off foreign oil and have project independence. But no. I think every pres president since Nixon has had That's something right. like that. Exactly right. Everyone has, and you see, we're not quite there yet. What's it like when you're putting when you're working on a speech that the president is going to give? This is just a, another good chance to think about this more broadly. I mean, because as you say, the president is responsible for anything that his staff puts down. The staff, as you note, is also responsible for anything the president puts down. Um, so when you get this dictate to create something called Project Independence, you turn to to, to Glenn Schlady, you turn to Ken Lay. What do you say? I mean, do you say? Well, we all tried to get it out. We all thought it was crazy. Anybody knew about the substance thought it was crazy. But if the president's going to say it, he's the president. Nobody elected us. So, you know, if, I guess if, if it had been Haldeman or something, I would have taken it out, taken it off. But you can't take it off the president. We told him a number of times. The staff view is this is not possible. He said we need a political rallying cry, just like, you know, John Kennedy needed. He had his reasons. And so he just went on. But uh, as far as, uh, you know, what's in the speech, there's always a, a certain give and take between the speechwriters and the substantive guys. And... Uh, uh, I delighted in beating the speechwriters into the ground like a, with a, like a stake because I later became a speechwriter myself and I used to think I could write pretty good speeches. And so uh, um, I delighted in, in uh, making sure that both my thoughts and my phrases got in there. <laughs> but girl, Ehrlich, I mean, uh, Gergen and I still speak to each other, so it's all right. The energy issue is really pivotal for the Nixon administration in 73 and on into 74. That it is. Um, how does how does Governor Love of Colorado come into the administration? Well, at that stage, when uh, when we first given this energy policy speech, uh, John Ehrlichman has then, because of Watergate, left together with Haldeman, and so uh, the new head of the Domestic Council is uh, Ken Cole, uh, who was you know roughly my age contemporary, um, and uh, the president decided that both for credibility, because you know he'd had to have his two senior guys leave, uh, and uh, to help his standing on the Hill, he would bring in a senior figure as a, a senior guru in the White House. So he brings in Mel Laird, who of course had been Secretary of Defense, had also been one of the very top Republican lawmakers in the House, uh, and had a lot of uh, gravitas, gray hair, and political power. And so I end up um, reporting to really him, and I became very close to Mel Laird and uh, his military assistant and, you know, 
his office. I mean, I just. Is this Colonel me. Presley at this point? No, it was uh, General. He uh, later became a general. Um, blanking on his name. Anyway, I, I, he he subsequently became the base commander at that uh, at Fort Lewis, uh, outside Seattle. Um, anyway, nothing of his name. And uh, so anyway, I'm working closely with Mel Laird, and Mel Laird says. Um, we're going to have to set up a new office uh, and we'll have something called the Office of Energy Policy. And I said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. He said, well, why not? And I said, because about two weeks ago I just closed down the Office of Emergency Preparedness headed by my favorite general, Abe Lincoln, who was head of OEP, which was across the street from the White House, and we, you know, we did disaster stuff. I was also in charge of disasters, which seemed appropriate to me. And uh, so we, I said, we've just done away with OEP, and the bureaucrats will never figure it out if we have a new OEP springing from the uh, brow of Zeus like this. And so he said, oh, you're right. What are we going to call it, wise guy? I said, we're going to call it Federal Energy Office. So we called it FEO. And then we brought in Governor Love because uh, he was a guy who had been around the track of a politician, uh, had a good record as an articulate politician, and didn't know much about energy, but they had coal and oil and stuff out in Colorado. Why not? And so then we're looking for a guy to uh, be his his chief uh, aide. And of course, you know there aren't any energy experts. Just a couple of guys in the, in the oil industry. So we find this guy who was head of the Center for Naval Analysis, called Charles De Bona, and he had been an ex-Navy officer, and then he had gone over there, which is kind of a Navy think tank, and very very smart guy. And uh, he thought this would be an interesting challenge. So we brought him in as the right-hand man to Governor Love, uh, and that's how we set up FEO in the first place. Now, the uh, Governor Love experiment doesn't last long. No, it didn't. Uh, he turned out just, you know, unfortunately, not to be the right guy for the right job in a very tough time. And, uh, you know, there were no guideposts to go by, and uh, he was kind of floundering around a bit, and we decided at that crucial moment we couldn't stand a lot of floundering. And so, uh, over the weekend, Mel Laird uh, called me in on Saturday, as I recall, and said, got to make a change. And uh, so we um, uh, called the governor and said, it's not going to work. And the uh, news got out. I think he told the press. And we tried to f uh, find Charlie Devona, his, uh, his staff guy. And Charlie was off doing some personal business, and they couldn't find him. And so by the time Charlie heard about on the radio that Governor Love was out, he figured he'd been fired and his ego was hurt, and so he left, even though we didn't want him to. So then we had to reconstitute the office all over again. Well, how do you do this? I mean, you're basically, you know, starting over with the new FEO, or uh, I think the name changes it yeah. very quickly thereafter. Federal Energy Administration. FEA, FEO, yeah. FEA. Yeah. Um, how do you reconstitute something? I mean, this is obviously a major policy problem as well as a political problem. Well, Mel Laird uh, said to me, "Okay, uh, you've got to go head this thing up," and I said, "I don't think so." Uh, you know, I got to go make some money. It's time for me to move on. He says, "No, no, no. You're the only one who knows anything about this." I said, "Wrong again." He says, "Okay, wise guy. Who else?" I said, "Look, my ops is number at OMB. He has followed this thing all the way through. He knows the environmental side. He knows the energy side. He knows the regulatory side. He has been he has been a consultant, uh, you know, uh, to big corporations. He's a tremendously successful consultant. Very smart guy. His name is John Sawhill. We'll get him." Laird says, "Great." So I bring in Sawhill. And I say, it's all yours, John. So uh, he had a background to do it, and he hit the ground running, and he started going on. When do you decide to leave the administration? <sighs> really not until um, after the Saturday Night Massacre, uh, because obviously I would started working for Bill Ruckelhouse, and uh, um, I didn't like the Saturday Night Massacre. The, as a matter of fact, the, that Saturday night, I was off at a dinner party in Washington uh, with some friends of ours, and somehow the press tracked me down. How they ever found me, I never figured out. But I started getting these calls. Have you heard that your old boss, Bill Ruckelhaus, has just been fired by the president? And, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm the only guy they can think of that worked in the White House and worked for Ruckelhaus. Do you have any reaction? No. And I'm going, hmm. And I said, I'm not taking any more calls to the hostess. You know, just put that away. And happily, the next morning, at seven o'clock in the morning. Russ Train, who was then head of the Council on Environmental Quality, Russ Train and I then got on a plane out at Andrews Air Force Base 
and uh, flew over to Europe for a NATO CCMS, Committee on the Challenges of Modern Society, would be supposed to be the, 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 the soft power part of NATO uh, on mutual environmental problems. And so we are greeted as we get off the plane by our ambassador to NATO, and he says, what in the world are you guys doing back there in Washington? And we're saying, you know, he and uh, Train and I have read the paper all the way across the pond saying, got some weird things happening here. And so the guy who greets us on the other side of the pond, the ambassador to NATO was? Don Rumsfeld. Don Rumsfeld, exactly right. He said, what's going on back there? I said, you don't want to know, Don. <laughs> and so happily, uh, uh, Train and I, who would have been right in the middle of a firestorm since we're the environmental guys, uh, we were gone for five days, thank the good Lord, and uh, then we came back and life went on. But, but I decided pretty much uh, to go away. And uh, so Ruckelhaus and I started talking, and uh, he then got hired by the German Marshall Fund, as I recall. And uh, I said, well, why don't we set up a law firm? And he said, well, I've talked to Albert Beveridge, who's also in Minneapolis. And, and so uh, the three of us decided to set up a law firm. And, uh, uh, so then I left uh, before President Nixon left uh, because I left in the early summer, late spring of, of 74. And uh, in my going away meeting with my wife and children, the President being the avuncular grandfather and everybody, he turns to me and he says, what are you going to do, Dick, uh, now that you're leaving the administration? I said, well, Mr. President, and I can't think to myself, I can't say I'm setting up a law firm with Bill Ruckelhaus, I mean, just fired. I said, I'm going to practice law, Mr. President, and change the subject. <laughs> So I never made it to the Ford administration. I just want to ask a, a few questions here at the end because you've been, you know, uh, involved in Washington and you've become basically a Washington lawyer. Um, not recently. I started practicing law in '92. Well, I don't think that many wa Washington lawyers actually practice. So yeah, well, <laughs> I haven't been at a law firm since '92, <laughs> let alone practice. Um, I want to ask you, what was? Different about the Nixon administration as you look back on you know on your service there and in other in other administrations. Well, my wife was uh, in the White House in the Reagan administration. I was in one of the agencies in the Reagan administration, so I know something about that. Uh, I knew a lot of people in the Carter administration. Uh, I knew obviously the Ford administration was mo mainly our Nixon guys, with just a couple of uh, other people there. Uh, and I've seen H. W. Bush administration, Clinton, uh, Bush, and now the beginnings of Obama. And uh, one thing that distinguished uh, the Nixon administration staff and the White House staff to me was, and I've seen them all, and I, I was not there at the creation. I wasn't one of the, uh, the, the fire-eyed uh, believers from the campaign, as I said. Uh, I think that the top to bottom, person for person, it was the most talented group uh, of any White House staff I've seen. And so in pure, raw, uh, intellectual candle power, it was a pretty good group of people. And uh, I remember looking back on it afterward, and if you looked and saw what uh, those people from that staff had ended up doing, it was pretty damn impressive also. Uh, you know, CEOs here and CEOs there and running this and running that, and, and uh, it, it showed that those people were, were a pretty strong, pretty strong uh, a cohort. And so uh, that was one thing that distinguished it. The other was uh, the procedures, and as I said, you know, how you structure things coming into the president. And uh, I never got along particularly well with Bob Haldeman. Uh, he, uh, I very, as a matter of fact, he tried to fire me once directly over the phone. And I got my secretary in tears and I said, we're gonna pack up and leave. And Ehrlichman called me a half an hour later and says, you're unfired. Uh, what had you done? Uh, or not done, or done I, in his eyes? I, I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't like a guy they were uh, bringing in uh, as a speechwriter uh, who had thrown stones at uh, what we were doing in the environment. I said, why are we hiring a guy who is, you know, trashing us out there uh, when he doesn't know what he's talking about? And so he then compared, uh, and Ehrlichman hired, I mean, uh, Haldeman hired him. He complained to Haldeman. Uh, Haldeman said, you know, and Ehrlichman, I'm not gonna, so just like that. Uh, but Bob and I were never close chums in any event. And uh, on the other hand, I think that the system that the president, Haldeman, and Ehrlichman put together, uh, was the template which has basically been used um, in most White Houses since because it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you don't want your president, A, buttonholed at the last minute, doing things off the top of his head. You want something that brings together the best advice he can get, and that's what they put together, so it made sense. How did you get to know General Haig? 
Well, Al was, uh, uh, he was on Henry Kissinger's staff. He was deputy, as I recall, national security advisor. Uh, but then, of course, uh, when uh, Holman Ehrlichman left, he became chief of staff. And so we were all, you know, all the guys who were kind of the top level advisors, the president at that stage, were running around with, with Al Haig all the time. And so, uh, um, you know, we just worked with him every day, and, and you get to know people when you do that. The same question, but about President Nixon during the administration. How, how did you get to know him? How well did you know him? Did you see him often? Well, when I first came in, um, I think I might have been in one or two meetings with him when I was at EPA, but really didn't know him at all. And then uh, John Whitaker uh, was not threatened, and so he used to bring me into meetings all the time, uh, both with other top-level people like, uh, you know, Kissinger and, and Schultz and, and uh, all of that, and also the president. And so I, I became somebody that at least the president didn't bridle if he saw me walking into the meeting, things like that. And, uh, and then as time went along and I moved up and took Whitaker's job, then I saw him, you know, probably on average almost daily. And so uh, uh, obviously uh, when you start interacting with someone that often, uh, they either fire you or they put up with you, and happily it was the latter with me. Now you mentioned uh, off camera that you'd seen President Nixon after he left the White House. So I'm quite a bit after the White House in, in two areas. One, uh, when I went into the Reagan administration, um, I went into, actually, in the, in the transition of the Reagan administration, uh, in transition I was put in charge of the Department of Interior, Agriculture, EPA, uh, da, da 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 the exact same portfolio I used to have. And I said, oh boy, have I been typecast. And I'd written the Republican platform in those areas, and I said, geez, I will never get out from under this. And so <coughs> they offered me a lot of jobs in that area. I said, no. Then Al Haig is appointed Secretary of State. And he says, you've got to go to the State Department. I go, yes, foreign policy. I like foreign policy. And um, so I go into that area. So uh, of course, I hadn't done anything in foreign policy since I'd been in the Navy. And uh, so I decided that uh, uh, the smartest person I knew in foreign policy was right down the road in New York. And his name was Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon didn't have a whole lot to do at that time other than write books with Ray Price. And so I could go up and set up meetings with him, which I did. And I would have these lovely two or three hour seminars, sitting at the feet of the great master, talking about the individuals uh, who were in positions of power and authority, uh, what the dynamics of geopolitics were at that stage. And uh, it was a fabulous learning experience. And I think it was good for him, because he saw through some things that he was doing in his books too, so it was useful for him. And so I saw him in that context a lot. And then uh, subsequently, when I left the government, um, I was at e uh, CSIS, the Think Tank Center for Strategic International Studies, and uh, Henry Kissinger is very involved with that think tank, and Henry, of course, is very close to Nixon, uh, was very close to Nixon, and they both each gave each other credit. It was really funny to watch. Well, you were the brains, and I was the brawn. No, you were the brains. And of course, you know, they were just very, I mean, people thought they were beating each other up, but no, they were very accommodating. And so uh, I saw him a lot in that context as well. And uh, and so he was, and then of course, uh, being in, by then a Nixon loyalist, I would go out to Nixon events per se. So I saw quite a bit of him after he had left the presidency. You were at the dedication of the Nixon Library and Birthplace in Yorba Linda. Indeed. What was that speech like? It was a, a, a typical Nixon uh, speech in that it was pithy, it was no notes, it covered the entire global circumstance of the moment. It analyzed where we had been and where we ought to go. And I would say everybody sat there wrapped, as they often did, uh, when he extemporaneously uh, uh, spoke. And it was just, uh, I mean, it wasn't just that all of us uh, knew him and most of us liked him and had worked for him. It was that we were, uh, we were listening to about as thoughtful and articulate a person on that set of subjects as, as then was breathing. There's one set of results that come up when you're when you are we your down name. to your last moment last moment last moment is my okay because I am yes um, and this is uh, this is actually a question because when you put your name into Google uh, one set of results that comes up is about Puerto Rico and the trust territories <laughs> yeah, yeah what 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 was that like <laughs> <laughs> well as I said you know there aren't that many uh, uh, positions in the White House staff and so they kind of you know put some dribs and drabs in various places. And uh, one of the drips and drabs we got, uh, since it didn't fall anyplace else, was, as I mentioned, uh, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and the Trust Territories. Now, of course, they can't be done by the State Department because they ain't foreigners. Can't be done by the Interior Department because 
that's not under you know the jurisdiction of, of the Interior Department, and so they can only be done directly by the White House, and so uh, I inherited those, and so when I used to fly down to St. Thomas and the Virgin Islands or to Puerto Rico, the governor would meet me at the airport. Again, I'm in my 20s, and they're going like this, and I'm going, come on, guys, this is silly. Uh, but obviously, it was a very important uh, nexus for them uh, with the federal government. And so in Puerto Rico, the governor, uh, Romero Barceló, uh, was a Republican. And um, the Republican Party position, there, there are three possible statuses for Puerto Rico independence, statehood, and commonwealth. And uh, uh, their status then as now was commonwealth. And uh, the Republican Party position was statehood. The radicals who used to shoot up the, shoot up the Congress and things like that, uh, their position was independence. And then the Democratic uh, Party position was keep, don't rock the boat, which is commonwealth. So um, Romero Barceló said, we haven't had a status uh, committee look at this for a long time. Let's set up a status committee. I said, fine. So we set up a status committee, and we put in some Republican senators, some Democratic senators, some Republican congressmen, Democratic congressmen, da, da, da. Usual kind of, you know, bipartisan study group. And uh, we would go down to Puerto Rico and hold hearings, and we would come back here and, you know, nah, talk to everybody. And so at the end of the day, uh, and this came under us just for historical reasons. I had to go someplace, and we were the place. And uh, so when we finally came up with the uh, conclusion, it was state commonwealth. And Romero Barcelo met me out at, for some reason I was staying that time out at uh, a golf course, the Rock Reserve golf course outside, outside San, uh, San Juan. And he was so mad, he was literally purple in the face. He's holding the golf club like that, and the first three swings he whiffed, he was so mad, because you have undermined my position. You have sold out the Republican Party. I said, that's what the study group came up with. And uh, so it was uh, a very interesting and traumatic time, but I gather interesting. Is there anything else you'd like to put on the record? <sighs> I don't think I have any more records. <laughs> and Mr. Fairbanks, thank you so much for being with us. I enjoyed it. Thank you.